Hey, everybody. Welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come, Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we're going to be in 3 Nephi 17 through 19. And Bryce, what is the main thing in these chapters here? Well, clearly when Jesus visits America, the main thing is to come to understand him, his personality. And we've kind of seen that. We saw that in 11 where he was a one by one until they all. We're certainly going to see that in 17 where he invites them and the children and he blesses them and prays for them. So outside of coming to see the gentle character of the Messiah, I think the main thing that he needs to establish here in America is let me show you Nephites and Lamanites and everyone who reads the Book of Mormon how the Savior operates. He operates by delegation through his anointed prophets, seers, and revelators. And so I think we need to start in 19, Mike. I think that's Of these three chapters, 17, 18, and 19, I think we need to start in 19. We'll go back and catch 17 and 18, but let's keep the main thing the main thing. Now, a little homework. If you want to pause this podcast and go do it and then come back, it'll be much more beneficial to you, is to go through 3 Nephi 19 and identify all of the theys, all the pronouns, because there's a couple possibilities. They are either the multitude or they are the disciples. And as you really read through this, and you identify the they's, then you begin to see a very clear pattern emerge. Most of the they's are not the multitude. And I think that's a mistake we often make, isn't it? We read it and we're like, the people that are there, they're all encircled by fire, and isn't this wonderful? But we have that in a different chapter. Yeah. Well, 11 and then 17, we see him with the multitudes. We see that he is a one-by-one God. We see that he loves us individually. We each have an individual relationship with him. But now he's trying to establish the pattern of how he officiates on earth in his absence. This is so important. This is crucial to understand. This is us today, right? Yes. This is crucial to understand that this is how he operates. So once you've identified all of the they's here, you begin to see that Jesus is, again, I'm going to say this one more time to make sure you understand the emphasis here. He is not diminishing his care for the multitude. If he has anything, already he's doing the opposite. Yeah, he's already established how much he cares the multitude. But in chapter 19, he seems to be separating a little bit and showing the role that the disciples are now going to play. So who gets baptized here? It's not everyone. He doesn't baptize the multitude. First they go down to the waters and they get baptized. Meaning the disciples get baptized. And as soon as they, the disciples, get baptized, verse 13, the Holy Ghost did fall upon them. And who was them in this case? The disciples. Yeah, that's important. So somehow the multitude were eyewitnesses that the Holy Ghost fell. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how they saw that. But clearly the multitude could see that the Holy Ghost fell upon the disciples. Bryce, I think maybe one option would be verse 14, and I think where they're encircled by fire. Maybe they had that Abinadi experience or that Moses experience where their countenance shone. Remember those stories of Joseph There's, Smith where he would sometimes have that experience? There surely was something like that, right? And so that the Holy Ghost descends, and then they, meaning the disciples, get encircled by fire. They, meaning the disciples, converse with angels. And then verse 15, Jesus comes in the midst and ministered unto them. Meaning the apostles. Again, the disciples. So if I'm a member of the multitude, I'm sitting here watching the disciples get baptized. The Holy Ghost descends upon them. Angels come and minister unto them. And then Jesus himself comes and ministers unto them. And so listen to his prayer. He's going to pray, and he's going to reveal such an important doctrinal truth about how the Father and the Son operate on earth. So starting in verse 19, he departed out of the midst, and he bows himself to the earth, and he prays. And he says, Father, I thank thee 
that thou hast given the Holy Ghost unto these whom I have chosen. And it is because of their belief in me that I have chosen them out of the world. Father, I pray thee that thou wilt give the Holy Ghost unto all them that shall believe in their words. There's the key. I think that verse unlocks all those verses. Absolutely. That's the key. Jesus isn't showing favoritism here. He's showing a process. He's saying, I will speak to these disciples. I will speak to those whom I have chosen out of the world. Now, it's their responsibility. I love that he kind of says a few things about them. He says, I have chosen them because of their belief in me. That tells you something about prophets, seers, and revelators. I have chosen them out of the world. I love that back in verse 8, they spoke the same words Jesus had spoken, nothing varying from the words which Jesus had spoken. I think that's a commentary on who gets chosen to be a disciple. So I'm going to throw this at you, Bryce. Look at verse 19. So they're repeating the words Jesus speaks, and he's in the middle of them. In ancient Christianity, this is Hugh Nibley. He wrote a document called the Early Christian Prayer Circle. Anciently, Christians would, they would be in a circle and they would pray, and Jesus would tell them how to pray. And so I see this in a ritual context that maybe they're in it. This is a temple setting, and that maybe they're just like these ancient Christians are repeating the words. We're repeating what Jesus says. As just an interesting thought. I mean, when we read this stuff, and there's all these documents that are not in the Bible, you look at it and go, something's going on. Yeah. And if nothing else, at least it's symbolic that they are saying what Jesus, that's what, that's what makes the disciples the disciples. I think this is really timely because this podcast will be released right before right conference. Before. And I just want to just add my witness that regardless of what anybody says about their faults, it's their position. That's their right. position matters and they are his representatives and we will not go wrong by listening to them. And back to that key that he just unlocked, the key to gaining all of the blessings of the gospel is that we believe in the words that come through prophets, seers, and revelators. That is our test. The test of the prophets, seers, and revelators is to make sure they know the words of Christ well enough to give them to us as they've received them to believe in him, to be the examples. But I just love how he does this. He says, Father, give the multitude everything you just gave the disciples if they believe in the words of the disciples. we we got to take verse 21, and it's got to be highlighted. It I just, mean, in yeah. mine it is. Well, what he's going to do it again. What's fun is he's going to do it one more time. So he just gave them the Holy Ghost, and they're glowing like fire. Angels are with them. Jesus is with them. And then he prays and says, hey, the multitude can have everything these these guys have if they'll just listen to the words of the prophets. And then the next thing, I get—I don't know exactly how to take this, but he purifies them. I don't know how they knew, but somehow, maybe it was the fire, maybe it was the glowing, maybe it was something else, but he purifies them. And then he prays again and does the exact same thing. Notice in verse 28 is another prayer. It's a different but very similar prayer. And he says, Father, I thank thee that thou hast purified those whom I have chosen. And if I could just yell out my witness of Russell Nelson, thou hast purified those whom I have chosen because of their faith. I pray for them. Now, he's going to hand us a key. And also for them who shall believe on their words that they may be purified in me through faith on their words, even as they are purified in me. That's an example of where we've got to clarify the they's. We've got to clarify the pronouns. So let's read this clearly. Father, I thank thee that thou hast purified the disciples that I have chosen because of the disciples' faith. I pray for the disciples and also for the multitude who shall believe on the disciples' words, that the multitude may be purified in me through faith on the disciples' words. I think that reading of verse 28 just Critical. makes absolute sense. Critical. That the multitude may be purified in me through faith on the disciples' words, even as the disciples are purified in me. 
And therein, in t- both paces, both, both of those prayers, his prayer in 21, his prayer in 28, he just basically unlocks the key. If you want in our day to unlock the blessings of heaven in your life, you and I, we must heed the words of the disciples, of the prophets, seers, and revelators, as they remain pure and holy and filled with the Holy Ghost, and deliver the words that they have received from Jesus unto us. There's the key. I think understanding this helps us understand the entire order of the church. I think this settles a lot. I think we see some of this in the book of Exodus, where there's other people that rise up and say, no, I'm going to be the leader. And I love the narrative where Moses is like, well, if you're to lead, then the earth won't open up Korah and swallow you. And But if it does, then I'm in charge. And then the earth opens up, right? And Moses is like, ta-da. Uh, and the whole book of Exodus, to me, it's so easy to criticize those guys, but I'm like, that's us. Yeah. Like The book of Exodus was written about the saints following the prophet and our struggles and our challenges. And so I would invite all of us, as we think about these things, when conference hits, my wife mentioned this to me. She said to me, Mike, I don't want to hear what so-and-so on social media says about the talk. I want to hear the talk. Right. And I think we need we live in a world where we've got our phone in one hand and we're watching the prophet and I think this to me Mike Day this is me, me speaking. I think this is an invitation for us to say put your phone away and listen to my witness. Listen to my prophet and let the spirit teach you. Yeah, I remember Ezetap Benson saying don't drink below the horses. That's great. <laughs> don't drink below the horses. Go to the source. Yeah. Hear the prophets, seers, and revelators for yourselves, and watch the blessings. Now, think about that. Imagine if General Conference began like Third Nephi 19. What if before the meeting started, all of a sudden, fire came down and encircled the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and they began to glow? And what if we could see angels discoursing with them? And what if all of a sudden we could see Jesus whispering in Russell Nelson's ear? And then I love this verse in verse 25. What if when Russell Nelson stands up to speak at General Conference, you could see Jesus in the background, and what was he doing in 25? He's smiling upon them. Can you just picture, would you pay a little bit more attention to the words of President Nelson if you could see Jesus behind him just smiling with that look on his face like, this is exactly what I want everyone to know? What if General Conference began that way? Would you pay a little bit more attention? And that's what he's trying to accomplish here in Third Nephi 19. He's trying to wave his arms and say, this is how it works, folks. I speak to them, they speak to you, and when you heed their words, I give you every blessing that I give anyone else on earth. He doesn't have favorites, but he does have a process, and his process is to speak through his disciples, his prophets, seers, and revelators who he has chosen. I think if I had one thing to teach in these chapters, that would be it. Yeah. I mean, it's good stuff. All this is awesome. And as a nerd, I I, I would love to geek out about Micah 5 and Isaiah 52, because Isaiah 52 is all over the place in this. But the main message is this is how I do my kingdom. The Lord's like, this is it, guys. And if you remember back, if you've been with us for a while and you remember our podcast on the war chapters— The Nephites had all control, all power over the Lamanites. They had fortified their cities to the point where they did not have a weakness. The Lamanites attacked the weakest city that they knew and were slaughtered, lost a thousand men, and not a single Nephite was slain. This war should have been over, except for in the following two chapters, the Nephites started to contend with themselves and take issue with their leaders. And Mormon said it was their contention and dissension that brought about the war, that opened the doors and allowed the Lamanites in the front door. It's when we contend with our leaders, with the leaders of the church. We don't like what they have to say. And so then we push back on their humanness and their fallibility rather than accepting with patience and faith what they receive from Heavenly Father. I think another thing we can take out of what you just said is we need to be careful how we talk to each other. In social media, somebody can say something that's totally wrong, but how do we handle it? And, and I don't know if it's necessary for us to get out a hammer and just hammer each other. So I really do think that's the main thing. Now, there's lots of other things we can talk about in these chapters. I mentioned Isaiah 52. 
you know what, why don't we just do a couple verses? So this won't be the only time we talk about this, but Isaiah 52, awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust, arise and sit down, O Jerusalem, loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for nothing or for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. This is the Lord inviting the house of Israel to come on the throne. I call this the great exchange. Who are we trading places with? Well, in Isaiah 47, 1 through 5, God says to Babylon to get off the throne and sit down on the ground and for Israel to take her place. And so this is an exchange. And in essence, that's what's happening ritually with these people. They are arising. They're putting on their beautiful garments. They're being taught how to pray. And if you take a really close reading of 3 Nephi 19, for example, look at verse 30. They become the shining ones. They were white even as Jesus. Look at the end of verse 34. They pray words that cannot be uttered or that cannot be written down. In 3 Nephi 19, 31 and 32, it says that Jesus prayed to the Father. Verse 32 says, And tongue cannot speak the words which he prayed, neither can be written by man the words which he prayed. And why is this? Well, I think from a ritual perspective, they're saying sacred prayer. We're not going to write it down. There's lots of levels to this, but I think this whole story is them leaving Babylon and they're coming into God's presence. And so they're astonished. Look at verse 11 of Isaiah 52. Depart ye, depart ye, go out from thence, touch not the unclean thing, go out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Why? Verse 10, the Lord's going to make bare his arm to all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God. So we're seeing this. We're seeing this right here in verse 8. The watchmen are lifting up their voice and they're singing and they see eye to eye. I see this as they're in a circle. They're surrounding Jesus who's in their midst and Jesus takes us home. I like that Isaiah 52 is the backdrop to this. Another thing I like to at least talk about, and this is difficult at first when we read this, and how do you take this, Bryce, when you read about how they're praying, but notice verse 18 of chapter 19. It says, they began to pray and they prayed unto Jesus. And we know this is their second day. If you go to chapter 19, verse one, it says that when Jesus had ascended into the multitude, the multitude did disperse. That's the end of the first visit. So the rest of the chapter is this second visit. And so they're praying to Jesus. And so sometimes I think maybe teachers might get this question, you know, we pray to the father in the name of the son, but here... Like, this is not the most important thing, but it's in the text, right? It is, and people need to remember that he's standing right there, and he's an omnipotent being, a resurrected and omnipotent being who not only knows what they're saying, but he knows their thoughts. And I would imagine when Jesus is in your presence, it is natural to direct your thoughts to him, as well as the intents of your heart. And it acts, you know, and I don't think it's, we cannot take this chapter as we should pray to Jesus, because we've been instructed by him not to do that. But in his his presence, I would imagine it's as natural as anything to find yourself communicating with him, whereas what we should normally do is communicate with the Father. So, I, I hey, counting all the times I've been in Jesus's presence, <laughs> I can't fault them for doing that because I, I can only imagine yeah. that being in his presence must be an overwhelming thing, and it's easy to direct your thoughts to him. Yeah, the God of heaven and earth. Look at, look at verse 22. This is what Jesus says about this. He says, You see, this is Jesus talking to his father, you see that they believe in me because thou hearest them and they pray to me and they pray to me because I am with them. Just kind of what you just said. So that's Jesus saying, hey, this is why I certainly don't know. When I get asked those questions, I say, gosh, I don't know. Here's some things to think about. And I throw a couple quotes out there. And so we'll put these quotes in the show notes, but we got some really good quotes. One of them is from Bruce McConkie, where he kind of says what Bryce is saying. So I'm not going to read it, but just know that in this instance, they do. And remember, as father of heaven and earth, he's their God. And the distinction and the understanding that he has a father and these kinds of things really start to be explained to them here. But I love how Jesus teaches them how to pray. So and just to nerd out, I really like verse 4 of chapter 19. I really like that 
Nephi's brother, who he raised from the dead, is one of the apostles. And wouldn't that be a fun story, Bryce, if we could get the book of Timothy and the story of how he died? Because I bet you it's a really cool story, right? He was probably killed by a bunch of villains and how he was raised from the dead. Like, there's just this huge backstory to verse 4 of a dude who gets raised from the dead. Anyway. Which is evidence that there really is a larger record that Mormon's pulling from, that Joseph isn't making this up on the fly. Because why would he include that? I just think that's cool. But wouldn't that be fun to have? Like, one day we're going to meet this guy. I'm like, tell me your story. Tell me your backstory. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so that's 19. But let's jump back to 17, because I love how 17 begins, and I think sometimes we skip it. Jesus gives us a formula for getting more out of scriptural truths and more out of the temple. I love applying this to the temple. He teaches them some wonderful things in 15, 16, and even the Sermon on the Mount words. And then he says in verse 2, this is 17, 2, I perceive that thou art weak, that you can understand all my words which I commanded of the Father to speak unto you at this time. Now tell me, when you walked away from the temple the first time, that that verse didn't apply to you. As if Jesus, if, if he were standing at the exit as you walked out, he probably would have said, I perceive that you are weak and that you didn't get everything that I was commanded to tell you in this endowment. Is that right? Therefore, so let me tell you how to get more out of Scripture and get more out of the temple. Step number one, notice, is not what you do in the temple. If you want to get more out of the temple, you need to do more when you go home. If you want to get more out of the scriptures, it's not so much what you do while you're in the scriptures. It's what you do when you close them and you walk away. Now, if all you do when you leave the temple is completely leave the temple, then we shouldn't be surprised if you don't pull out great eternal truths. But if you want to get more out of the temple, then this is what you do when you leave the temple. So he says, go home. And then he gives us this very simple process. Ponder the things. Keep them in your head. Keep them in your heart. Think about them. Wonder about them. Ask yourself questions about them. Ponder, why do we do that? I don't understand why we do that in the temple. May I just shout and scream that that right there is the invitation to Heavenly Father that I want more revelation because I'm thinking about this. I am letting this stir in my heart. I want you to know how much I want an answer by how much I think about it. How many times in the scriptures does a prophet receive revelation in that state of pondering? Yes. 138 comes to Joseph F. Smith because he's pondering over what he read in Peter's words about Jesus going to the spirit world. Section 76 on the three degrees of glory came to Joseph Smith because he's pondering this whole condition of heaven as he's translating the, the Bible. Nephi receives his vision of, his, of the tree of life because he's sitting there pondering his dad's words. It doesn't say this in the, in the Joseph Smith narrative, but I think the whole reason he went into the grove, he was pondering and the spirit was working on him. The spirit was like, no, you need to go pray. Yeah. Right? I think the spirit was just, was just wrenching him. Well, I love that phrase. These words sunk deeply into my soul. I reflected upon them again and again. There's a pattern right there. And so I think that's how we unlock revelation is by showing Heavenly Father how much I want to know by how often I think about them. So take the temple home. Take the temple ceremony home and ponder it. And then a very simple one. So that's number two. Go home. Number two is ponder. And then number three is just such a simple concept. Ask the Father that you may understand. How many of you kneel down and ask Heavenly Father in the privacy of your own prayer, please help me understand this particular part of the endowment or the sealing or a washing and an anointing or even this portion of the scriptures. Help me understand Isaiah. I don't get it, Lord. I thought about it a lot. Could you help me understand? What a simple concept. Ask the Father to understand. And then he says, prepare your minds for tomorrow because we're going to do this again. So it's that preparation. Go back to the temple prepared. And I think one of the ways I go back to the temple prepared is by looking for the things that I've been pondering. 
I'll never forget one day there was a certain portion of the endowment that really puzzled me, and I just wanted to understand the symbolism better. And I thought about it a lot. I searched through the scriptures. I found every reference in the scriptures to that particular image. And I thought about what he was trying to say. One day I went back to the temple to a ceiling session. And as I sat in the ceiling room, looking at the chandelier, I saw the image in the chandelier. And all of a sudden, just this flood of understanding. And I made connections that I'd never made before. And I was so grateful. But I think the key was that I went back into that temple looking. I had prepared my mind. I was looking for an answer. Go back to the scriptures looking for the answers that you've been pondering. Go back prepared. And then he says, number five, let's do this again tomorrow. I'm going to come again tomorrow. Don't do it one time. So think about that. Go home, ponder, ask, prepare, and return. Now, if all I ever do when I attend the temple is go home and then return, and I miss those three middle steps— you can see that I'm denying myself a great deal of opportunity to open the floodgates of heaven and receive revelation. I think this is okay to say that this is also, I think this whole thing is a temple context. We talked about this in the last podcast. This is a sacred experience where they're in the midst of God. And I think it probably would have been overwhelming. And I think everything you're saying fits because he says in the next couple of verses in chapter 17, he's like, I'm out. I got, I'm leaving. And then notice the end of verse five. They ask him to tarry and we get chapters 17 and 18. So the second day is going to be the beginning of 19. So we get two whole chapters because of they ask him to stay. God is always so quick to give us more than what we ask. Yeah, whatever size vessel we take to the Lord, he will fill. If you take a small little thimble to the Lord, that's what he'll fill. If you take a massive bowl, that's what he'll fill. Whatever you offer him, say, Lord, this is how much I want to receive. He always responds. He just, he'll he'll deliver whatever you have come prepared. So as soon as they, in their yearning and their tears, want him to stay, what does he do? He gives them more. He stays and he loves them. This really hits me in the Joseph Smith experience where he wants to know which church is true and which one he should join. In some of the other accounts, you know, he's also worried about his sins. So however you you list the list of the questions he asks, he gets the, the answers, but then he gets so much more. And my favorite part of the account that we have canonized at the end of the vision, after he explains, I saw the father and the son. He, he drops this line, Bryce, and to this day, I'm like, I want this line. I want to know. He says... And many other things did they say to me that I cannot write at this time. And I'm like, okay, what was that? I want that stuff. Yeah. I just think he, he got way more than what he asked. Which is the Savior's pattern, right? Because when they were hungry for bread, he fed them, and then they collected 12 basketfuls of what was left over, what they couldn't even eat. He gave them far more than they had asked for. And that's how it is. If you go to the Savior and say, I've had enough. Don't give me anything. He'll respond. If you go to the Savior and say, I would love you to stay in my life. Please don't leave me. He gives you two more chapters that he had said he wasn't going to get. He had said in 16, I'm leaving. He said in the earlier part of 17, I'm leaving. But because of their response, because how much they wanted him to stay, they got 17 and 18 where he had intended to leave. And do you see how it is with him? The more we want him, the more he stays and gives us. So good. So 17, he's going to heal him. They're going to be encircled about by fire. This is the multitude. He weeps for the house of Israel. And it's just a beautiful chapter to read. In the 18th chapter, this is the sacrament. And there's really going to be two feasts in this narrative. There's going to be this feast in chapter 18, and then a later feast where Jesus miraculously provides the bread. He brings the bread in the final feast. But in this feast, what we read is that he tells the disciples to go get bread and wine. So they go and get it. And then verse three says that they come and they bring it and they break it and they bless it. And then Jesus teaches them, hey, this is the sacrament. This is what we're going to do. So verse six, 
This shall ye always observe, even as I have done, even as I have broken bread and blessed it and given it to you. And this ye shall do in remembrance of my body, which I have shown unto you. And it shall be a testimony unto the Father that you do always remember me. And if you do always remember me, you shall have my spirit to be with you. Which kind of talks about the dual nature of the sacrament. It's a memorial and a testimony. And sometimes we don't think about that as we're in in the middle of the sacrament. First of all, it's a memorial. We are to remember him. We are to pause and remember everything that he's done. I love that in the Mark account, he says, remember me that I was with you in this hour. And I love to ponder what during the sacrament, all the times the Savior has been with me in my hour. It's not just remember his sacrifice. We are supposed to remember what he did with his body and with his blood. But we're also supposed to remember the times that he has made special, the times he's been with us. And we promise, Lord, I promise, I will remember. And then I love the second part in verse 7, which he repeats. So bread in 7, water in 11, and you'll see the similarity in those two prayers. He says, do this in remembrance and witness unto the Father. So you are making promises. You are testifying to the Father that you will do certain things, and one of them is to remember. And I love that he just points those out, that we all need to remember that if we properly take of the sacrament, we will remember and testify, remember and witness unto the Father. And if we do that... We will have the Spirit. And I love the fact that four times in this chapter, in verse 4, in verse 5, in verse 9, they were filled. And that's the promise. I think sometimes we read the sacramental prayer and say, oh, the promise is to always have it with me. And yes, that is true. But if you go back to those three verses, 4, 5, and 9... The promise is that by making these covenants, by remembering Jesus always, and by promising the Father to do the things you've promised to do, that will fill you. That will satisfy a hunger inside you that nothing in the world can satisfy. Money cannot buy what the sacrament will do if you keep it. Fame will not bring into your soul what the sacrament and the covenants and remembering Jesus. There is a hunger inside the human soul that gets filled when we keep our covenants, when we remember the Savior and we witness unto the Father. And you'll see it again. We'll get to 20 next time. But notice how many times, verse 8, he that eateth this bread eateth of my body, he that drinketh of this wine drinketh of my blood, and his soul shall never hunger nor thirst, but shall be filled. And then in verse 9, when the multitude had eaten and drunk, behold, they were filled with the Spirit. So I know we hear the promise that you'll have the Spirit always. But I think we also need to emphasize that the promise of not just the sacrament, but all of his covenants, the promise of remembering Jesus and testifying to the Father is that that hunger inside us is filled. I love how Haggai in the Old Testament describes it. If you want to turn to a quick Haggai verse, Haggai is a prophet of the return of the Jews to Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity. And they were told to build up the house of the Lord first, and they've kind of not done that. They put more attention into building their own houses. They overdid it. It's not that, you know, oh, we need a house to live before we can build a temple. They were focused on their own homes, and the temple was just left undone. And so the Lord speaks to Haggai in verse 6, Haggai chapter 1, verse 6. And think of this in terms of being filled. He says, you have sown much. And you bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put them into a bag with holes. 
there is a yearning inside the human soul that the gospel and that remembering Jesus and keeping his covenants fills in a way that nothing else will. So I love that he just emphasizes that word filled. I I can't even emphasize that enough. I call it cotton candy. I think the world offers a lot of cotton candy. And if you've ever eaten cotton candy while you're eating it, you're like, ooh, this tastes really good. And then all of a sudden your blood sugar comes down and you're so hungry. And there's something that the gospel fills that nothing else can fill. And there's a passage in the book of Revelation where John sees the wicked and he says they have no rest day or night. They're always chasing. And I think that's really what Haggai is trying to say. When the Israelites come back after Cyrus lets them free, and you know, around 540, 539, and they're questioning, do we build the temple? What do we do? And I think that's Haggai's message. You build my house, I'll build your house. And when I, when the Lord says, I'll build your house, he's talking about your family, but he's talking about your your bag that holds the money, your grain. I'm going to bless you. You're going to prosper. You're going to thrive. This is the first feeding in the 18th chapter. In the 20th chapter, Jesus feeds them. From a ritual perspective in the first temple, there were two feasts. There was one in the second room where you're standing and you can see the veil and you eat the bread of the presence. The second feast is now when you're on the rock and you're in God's presence ritually. Look what it says in the 18th chapter. I love how, how Bryce mentioned that. I, In fact, I highlighted in my scripture, verse 4, 5, and 9, you will be filled. That's so powerful. And if you do this and you remember my blood, verse 11, look at the end of verse 12. If you do this, blessed are ye, for you're built upon my rock. And if you're built upon my rock, verse 13, then you're on my foundation. And, and now I'm packaging Matthew in this, but you're a wise man. You're somebody who has wisdom. Why? Because you remember Jesus. And that first feast in the second room of the temple, to me, that's what I think of when I take the sacrament. Yesterday when we took the sacrament, I'm like, okay, we are practicing for the feast we're going to have with Jesus when we meet him again. And so what's going to happen? Well, we're going to be received. Look at 17, 18, 19, 20. We're to watch and pray. And Satan wants to sift us, but if we watch and pray and we do the right thing, verse 21, we pray in our families, uh, we'll be received. We'll be received into his presence. And so what do we do? We meet oft, verse 22. That's what we're to do. I struggle with 24. Hold up the light that it may shine into the world. Behold, I am the light. And we've talked about this in the other podcast, Bryce. You know, how do we... How do I be a good Christian, but I'm not drawing attention to me? And so that's a constant thing, right? Because we're supposed to be holding up the light, but then sometimes our detractors accuse us of, oh, you're bragging or you're doing this. And so I don't have the answers. Well, I love what he does here. I love that he points out two specific things. I know we always read verse 24 and say, oh, hold up your light. I am the light that you're supposed to hold up. And we sometimes read that as, oh, everything Jesus did, I'm supposed to do. And there's definitely some truth to that. But he points out two things. And that's what we're supposed to hold up. So he says, hold up your light. I'm the light. And then he says, number one, hey, did you notice that I prayed unto the Father for you? I prayed. Back in chapter 17, he took those children and one by one, he prayed unto the Father for them. And then he says, secondly, did you notice that I didn't push anyone else away? I let everyone who wanted to come to me, come to me. I didn't push anyone away. And then he says, even so shall ye do unto the world. So yes, I'm supposed to emulate all that Jesus did. But here is the Savior. Now this is, I think, significant. Jesus is pointing to two attributes. This is what I want you to do. Number one, Would you pray for each one in your circle? Would you pray one by one for the people in your circle? So parents, would you pray for your children one by one, like I prayed one by one for the children? Bishops, would you pray one by one for the members of your ward? Young women's leaders, would you pray one by one? In other words, let your ministering be a personal ministering, not a, I'm a generally good person. Would you focus on the one? That's how you hold up the light of Jesus. You That's focus great. on the one. That's great application. One at a time. 
If you have 10 children, you focus on one at a time. You don't, you don't let any of them out. That's the second one he'll say. You notice I didn't push anyone out. I let everyone come to me in their own turn. In other words, Jesus is saying, be a one by one until they all member of the church. Be a one by one until they all parent. If you're a teacher, be a one by one until they all pray for each one in your class. He even handles the difficulties here in 28 and 29 and 30, where he says, okay, if they're unworthy, they're not going to take the sacrament, but I still want them in church. Yeah. And that's an interesting thing because, you know, well, how do we determine this? Apostles and prophets have said, if you're repenting, you're on the path. But this rebellious attitude, and yet there are those that are kind of rebellious and they're in a state of doubt and they're maybe they're not on the path, but they want to come to church for whatever reason. And I see Jesus saying, hey, bring them in. And I think there are parents out there who have children that are maybe in this state, right, where they're they're angry at their parents or they're angry at their religion or whatever. And I think what you're talking about is this is perfect application where the Lord is essentially saying, bring them in. Pray Do, for them one by one yeah, and bring them in. Be- Never push them out. As best as you can. Now, there are things that they won't be able to participate in because of the choices they're making. But Jesus says, notice I didn't kick him out of the synagogue. I didn't kick him out of my life. I didn't kick him out of my love and my efforts to to do all that I could for them. I love that he focuses on those two aspects. That's a great application. So what makes a Christian? If Jesus is allowed to define what makes Christianity, I would throw in this scripture. I'd go back to John chapter 13 where he says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Jesus declared what Christianity is. By this shall men know if you are my disciple, if you have love one to another. And then here again, he confirms that. He says, look, here is what I want you to hold up. Pray for them like I prayed for you, and don't push them out of your life like I didn't push anyone out of my life. And I love how that ends. I love that Jesus says, look, yes, hold up my whole life, but of all the things in his life to hold up, those are the two to hold up. So to do this, I have to know their names. If I'm a bishop, I need to know my youth, call them out by name. If I'm a parent, I'm thinking about these children. When you pray with your family and you're specifically mentioning people, there's a different spirit than just we're kind of getting through the prayer. Yep. For me, it's almost like you're tapping into the powers of heaven because heaven knows who they are. There is this verse in the book of Genesis in the 16th chapter. This is where Sarah, she's struggling because she doesn't have children. She wants to fulfill this commandment that they're going to have seed. And so she goes to Abraham and she says, take my handmaid and bring seed to the Lord through her. And so he does. In verse 10, this is where Hagar is so sad. She's been cast out. And so in Genesis 16, verse 9, the angel of the Lord said to her, return to thy mistress and submit thyself to her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, the angel speaking to Hagar, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said, behold, thou art with child, thou shalt bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And in the footnote, if you look in footnote 11a, God hears. That's it. That's his name. His name means God hears. In other words, in this narrative in the Bible, Ishmael and his descendants kind of become enemies to these covenant people, these the, the children of Jacob. And in Genesis, at least in the beginning, God says, no, I know who they are. I'm here. I know who you are, Hagar. And I just want to bear my witness of that, that God knows who you are and he knows who your kids are. And I love how you broke that down, Bryce, where you basically said, listen, here it is. He prayed into the Father for them, and then he did everything he could do to include them. I think that's just, that's brilliant. That is Christianity. It is. By his own words, he says, this is what I want you to do. Now, while we're speaking about children, I can't help but go back to chapter 17 for one brief moment. I know you all love 17, and you've read it so many times, but there is one word in chapter 17 that absolutely haunts me. It absolutely haunts me, and I'm going to let it haunt you because I think it's a good haunting. 
So Jesus is so moved by compassion, he says, can I heal you? Which is a wonderful phrase. Let me heal someone else that you love because of how much I love you. That's an interesting phrase on the Savior, but we'll leave that. So he heals them, and he wants to do more. So he says, let me have your children. He commands that the children should be brought. So let me set the stage here. Remember, we're living in a terrestrial society because all the telestial wicked people have been destroyed. That was the destruction that occurred previously. There doesn't seem to be a telestial person here in the Americas. It's terrestrial and above. Jesus then calls the children forward. Let me put myself in that story. So my wife Jennifer and I have a son who can be a handful. Bless his heart. Jesus calls him forward. So there's Jesus with my little son, Owen. And the first thing he does when he holds the children, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but this haunts me. He groans. Jesus is holding Owen and he groans. Now he says he groans, I'm troubled because of the wickedness of the people of the house of Israel. But all the celestial people are gone. So what does that mean? Owen will not be kidnapped. Owen will not be molested by a child molester. All of the celestial are gone. So who is he groaning about in this verse? May I suggest to you, He's groaning about the parents. I think Jesus is holding Owen, and he's looking over at Jen and I, more me than Jen, clearly. And he's saying, really, Heavenly Father, really? That's the best you can do for this sweet little boy? I think this is a commentary on how he feels about children. And even these good people don't seem to be good enough for the children. I think he's groaning over me. I had a little experience with Owen not too long ago. Owen is my helper. He's my little shadow. And um, whenever I build, I'm a carpenter. I love building furniture. And one day I had a project, and it was a Saturday, and I, I stained something, and I left the stain outside. Sunday came, and my wife forgot something for her lesson, and I wasn't teaching that hour. So she said, could you run home? And Owen was having a problem. He was, So I took Owen with me. So Owen and I ran home, and while I was gathering the things that my wife needed, Owen wandered out to the backyard and grabbed the stain. Sunday close, and he's holding a can of stain And so he walks in and said, Dad, you forgot this. Now, this is just a little boy trying to help his dad. Dad, you forgot the stain. He doesn't know what does to clothes. And I turned around and freaked out because all I saw was the stain in his Sunday clothes. And I kind of snapped. And I said, Owen! And Owen, being startled, dropped the can. And it spilled all over our wood floor. And just in that moment, I heard Jesus groan. I heard Jesus groan. What's he going to do, Father? And I heard him say to me, Bryce, he is a little boy. You startled him. He doesn't know what stain does to clothing. He was just trying to help his dad, who he loves. You startled him, and he dropped the stain. Don't you yell at that little boy. And this scene of Jesus groaning came back into my mind. And I looked, and I saw terror on my son's eyes. And so I just grabbed him, and I just held him, and I said, It's okay, Owen. I am so sorry I startled you. Thank you for bringing in my stain. I forgot and left it outside, didn't I? You're such a great helper. Thank you, Owen. Man, I love you. And I think Jesus just saved me there in that little moment. He groans. 
There is a beautiful, I love this, from Boyd K. Packer. At the culmination of his ministry, he said the following in April of 2002. He said, like my brother and I have traveled all over the world, like my brother and I have held positions of trust in education, in business, in government, and in the church. I have written books and like them have received honors and degrees and certificates and plaques. Such honors come with the territory and are undeserved. Assessing the value of those things, the one thing I treasure more than any of them, more than all of them put together, the thing of most value to me is how our sons and daughters and their husbands and wives treat their children. That's significant. May we remember Jesus groaning. May we pray for each one of those children individually and never push them away. Never push them away from the circle of our love. I just, I love these chapters, Mike. I just think that's so significant and insight into his character. Thanks for sharing that story about your son. I It's hard as a parent sometimes to talk about times when we mess up, but we all do. And that is a haunting verse. It's a sweet haunting, right? It is. It's a sweet haunting. Just, I'm, it's I'm, a, you can do better, Bryce and Mike. You can do better at this, but please remember that I'm on the side of the child. Yeah, I'm just I'm just at a loss for words. I'm thinking about how many experiences have I had like that and and what can I do better? And yet I just keep coming back to this. We get on the path, we stay on the path, and and the Lord hears us. He knows who we are. And uh, my testimony is that Jesus is everything that these pages say that he is and more. And he's real. And we are the children. I know he's holding little ones and I'm the big one, but in his eyes, I'm still the little one. I'm still the child. And he just adores each one of us. I love that concept of Jesus praying for each and every one of us. He does. I know that. I know he has a prayer for each one of us and pleads to the Father that we receive the blessings he knows we need. I think with that, we're going to end. Have a great conference weekend. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.